Hey friends, stick around to the end. I have an announcement. Roll the intro. So as I mentioned in my last video, I kind of wanted to do a condensed history of Native representation throughout the Western world, particularly here in North America, United States. That's from my perspective because I'm American. So in order to talk about where we are now, we need to contextualize the past and we need to go to the beginning so that we can see the patterns that have developed throughout the Western world. Without further ado, let's start at the beginning with literature. And if you don't think chimps will steal babies and eat them, you haven't been paying attention to the literature. That's correct, yeah, sir. I, I haven't yeah. been paying attention. So to go kind of at the beginnings, there's usually one era of you know, European and native contact that doesn't get talked about much, and that's with the Norse. The Norse's depictions of natives are very kind of like nonchalant like they don't go into very much detail so the, to start off like you know you had people like eric the red and leaf erickson hey everybody it's leaf erickson day Hinga dinga dargan. leaf erickson you know he settled in vinland and other places like that they called it vinland at the time which is most likely around new finland area he landed there but he didn't have too many interactions with natives and if he did like he didn't really talk about it so the depictions that we have of natives from the Norse come from two main sagas written, you know, kind of historical accounts. Actually, they are historical accounts, but for a long time, they were kind of seen as uh, historical fiction or straight up fiction. You have the Saga of Eric the Red and the Greenlanders Saga. These sagas that record these voyages were around a tenth in about early 11th century AD. They tell of the two lands, mainly Vinland and Markland. And a couple, you know, over time, they started calling the strange peoples that they came across, uh, Skraelings. I'm not Norse, so I don't know how to say it properly, but that's just the best way I could say it. It's debated where the origin of this name comes from. Some speculate that maybe it comes from talking about skin, like uh, like the fact that they wore skin. If you are Norwegian or Icelandic, like give some insights in the comments. I'd be very curious to see the different translations and maybe what it means for you. But it is very obvious that at this time, they're specifically referring to native peoples. Now who these people are, it's unclear. The two prominent types of native peoples that they most likely came across were probably Inuit folk, uh, who later actually started inhabiting Greenland around the 15th century, but they potentially probably ran across them there, or most likely Algonquin speaking tribes, maybe Mi'kmaq, potentially Haudenosaunee, who knows, we don't know for sure. In the Eric the Red saga, we have a first-hand account by a man named Thorfinn Karsafeni, but that's, I'm totally butchering it, like it's probably not accurate at all. Uh, this guy, he traveled along with Eric the Red in his voyages, and he has some interesting depictions in the saga of Eric the Red of the native people that they came across. And it's really funny to read it. They're kind of just like, oh, we came across them. Oh, then we killed them or they attacked us. It's really funny. It's just like, it's not, it doesn't have a lot of drama to it. <laughs> it's just like, oh yeah, it happened. It's very much like cut and dry historical. This is what happened. So here is um, Thorfinn Karsveni's depiction or a description of the natives they ran across. And it's rather fascinating. And it's funny, like he kind of goes into the physical descriptions uh, of these people. He said they were large eyed, which I thought was kind of a fascinating description. <laughs> Broad faces. And later on, we kind of see the same description by other Euro um, European accounts that, you know, these people had large, like broad faces, which is an interesting 
uh, way of looking at it. But he said that they were ill looking, which I thought was pretty funny too. Because obviously, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, with these accounts, I'm not trying to like, you know, criticize their depictions. I'm purely, I'm, I'm purely just looking at it, you know, and just wondering like, you know, in contextually, what does it mean? And obviously, because Norse people didn't look like this. So like, the next saga, the description that we have of the Skraelings, the natives, comes from Leif Erikson's brother, actually. Leif Erikson came earlier, but he never actually settled, but his brother was inspired to go back. And in, in this case, uh, his brother, who is Thorvald Erikson, he actually had contacts with natives and he traded and fought with quite a few. He doesn't really describe them really, he just kind of talks about his experience with them and it was obviously very hostile. Thorvald was, you know, he was wounded by Graylings attack uh, after they had kidnapped a few of uh, killing people and killed a couple. So it was obviously, you know, the, the natives were kind of going after, you know, going out for blood because they did this. And he was shot underneath uh, with an arrow. I'll have links to the these two sagas in the description below so you can check them out yourself. They're very fascinating to read regardless if you're looking at um, native representation, just how they looked at the land itself. So it, one thing to note that is, is fascinating too is that Christianity has been introduced to the Norse by this point already. However, you, you can imagine that for a people where Christianity is still new, that a lot of the old beasts and the old gods and all of the old things from their culture are still relevant in their minds. So I'd wonder, and obviously the natives too are very obviously superstitious. We are still, in my opinion, a quite a superstitious people today. I, it's fascinating to, to think that when they came across each other, they had probably initially thought that they were either demons of, of some sort or bad spirits or something. It's fascinating to think about how our worldview affects how we perceive others. A lot of it purely is just from misunderstanding, like they just came from two different worlds. But yeah, those depictions of native, peop of native peoples by the early Norse are much more fascinating than the later ones just because they're not super focused on, you know, getting every little thing. They're just talking about what happened. Like, oh yeah, we went to Vinland and Markland and this is what happened and this is why it happened, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's interesting. And it's ironic that later when we get to Amerigo Vespucci and Christopher Columbus, those two weren't certified like quote unquote explorers. They were merchants. When as uh, Leif Erikson and Eric the Red and uh, Thorfinn Kalsfeni and Thorvald Erikson they were all legitimately explorers. Like they went exploring for the sake of exploring and looking for new land and everything. And uh, it's fascinating that their depictions are just like less descriptive when merchants were very descriptive later. So going into like almost 500 or so years later, yeah, about 500-ish years later when we get to Amerigo Vespucci and Christopher Columbus. Obviously, Christopher Columbus was the first one to actually settle and colonize the Americas, but Amerigo is interesting because he coasted South America. It's whether or not he was in Central America, but for sure he went to South America and he went all the way down to the tip. And his descriptions that he has they aren't, we don't know for sure like which people he's talking about in particular. We just don't know. Between 1497 and 1504, that era, there were two famous writings that were, that came out from him. One of them was from his own words. That one was called Mundus Novus, which is the new world. That came out in 1503.
The second letter that came out from Amerigo was the letter to Sor Sodarini. I think that's how you say it. That was arguably not written exclusively by him. Some scholars theorize and speculate based on how it's written and everything that it was written by someone else. But this letter, it was also very popular, popularized in describing, you know, the, the new world. Now, with Amerigo, he gives the native peoples a little more grace. And of course, you know, Amerigo is still very, you know, coming from his European lens, right? So obviously his depictions are going to be a little backhanded, slightly condescending. But when you compare it to Christopher Columbus, it is so much more fascinating. <laughs> he, uh, I would argue Amerigo was actually fascinated with these people. Looking back at Columbus, again, like you can read so much about what he's done and everything, but his depictions are certainly a lot more harsh compared to Amerigo Vespucci's. And I think it's because he comes from the idea of utilization. He wants to see more how the land and the people can be used for colonization. It's interesting to see that, that with the descriptions by both of these men, we had a frenzy, a fascination with the new world. Not only with the land and what it had to offer, but also like with the people, or the exotification of these people are capturing the minds of everyone in the old world and wondering more about this new world. And I'd argue that along with the actual colonization of the new world by Columbus, the descriptions of native peoples came along with that. Everyone had an expectation or a fascination with native peoples since that colon colonization process. So that's just, you know, the begin like the beginnings of, of, of it here. I think it's fascinating to look at the groundwork of depictions of native peoples from this viewpoint. The Norse depictions don't have too much effect on how native peoples are viewed today in particular, but it's still fascinating to look at because back in the old world, no one really knew too much about you know, the people in Vinland, just the got people who wrote about it. It was more of, I'd, I would love to do more research and see whether or not if it had a, as much imagine, struck the imagination of people in the old world as much as Columbus's and Vipsucci's descriptions did for people, you know, 500 years later. But I, that's just one little bit here I wanted to touch on. The next video, I'm going to be talking more about liter the literature, fictional mostly, throughout the colonized America. Uh, going all the way from like the late 1600s all the way until the late 1920s. Just looking at the patterns that have developed in literature itself and how those descriptions of native peoples actively shape the way people perceive native peoples today. So yeah, I'll see you guys in the next one. Okay, so like I said, there was kind of like an announcement of sorts. I realized that the name of this channel is a little too niche and a lot of people don't understand why I called it Kino Native. So from here on out, I'm just gonna change it to Native Media Theory. Um, I feel like that's a lot more straightforward. It's a lot more easy to remember. Kino Native is very niche. I might use the word Kino Native as like a noun, but yeah, from now on, we are going to be Native Media Theory.